coach John Weaver. Thanks for coming on, coach. Man, I appreciate it. Um, people that do podcasts and, and help coaches and other business leaders and organization leaders um, through my journey and all that stuff. I mean, I'm more than happy to help out today and, and provide some kind of insight to, uh, to our coaching profession. Yes, sir. And excited to learn a little bit more about your podcast, The Culture Classroom. So just to kick things off, I'm going to introduce Coach Weaver. So he is the associate AD and then co-offensive coordinator at Madison Ridgeland Academy. So before we get started, Coach, can you just share with the audience a little bit about your background and how you got involved in coaching? Yeah, uh, I knew from an early age that uh, in eighth grade that I wanted to coach and, and be in the education field. So uh, my grandparents and my dad and all that were like, you're not going to make any money. And I said, and it, in eighth grade, I think you're what, 13 years old, something like that, 12 years old. Money really didn't appeal to me that much. But uh, my coaching journey uh, was well on. When I played in high school. I played in junior college. I played at Delta State. And uh, I just knew I wanted to impact lives of some kind of sense in in some profession, uh, whether it be coaching or uh, administration or anything like that. So for me, it was really evident that impacting kids was going to be a, a deal for me. And it's been a calling from God that has helped me transition through this and starting out as uh, an assistant at the lowest level to now where um, we're the largest independent school in Mississippi and um, doing this and, and loving it being the associate AD, which I handle all the marketing and um, fundraising and all that stuff with our school, but man, seeing kids um, and, and helping them uh, along their journey of some of them that want to be coaches that are in education right now uh, or uh, at our school right now that want to be coaches. So you want to help them out, but man, my, my journey is, 19 years long uh, I've been in it 13 years at MRA and I've been in it for 19 years once at a graduate assistant at Delta State and then transitioned uh, and almost got out of coaching early when I worked in Birmingham for the Gulf South Conference but when God puts something on your heart man you, you kind of go after it right kind of yeah. <laughs> he's like hey that's your plan I got my plan and that that's kind of where we're at and I've uh, been here 13 years um, I'm also the head voice track coach here as well so um coaching is a big part of my life my son uh, wants to coach already and he's only six wow <laughs> so, him wow. roaming the sidelines and helping with laundry and all that stuff um it's good yeah and when you were just talking about like having that calling so for me you know I always knew I wanted to be involved in in sports whether it be football or just sports in general mm -hmm. and when I graduated from college a couple years ago I had this opportunity with my business and it was kind of like an un, an unusual like avenue to get into sports. So I've been having a great time with it and just having conversations with people like yourself, just talking about like, what are, what are your philosophies, your journey? And then I'd also love to hear like, can you just share a little bit more about what it's like handling all those roles as the coordinator, the, the athletic director and, and so forth? Uh, well, the biggest thing is, uh, as the light just went out, I'll, I'll go and fix that in a second, but it's, um, organization is a huge part of it. And I'm going to stop right there, turn this light on. So we don't have the, the dim light. Yeah. I'll, I'll cut this part out too. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. So I think the biggest part of it is, Justin, is with uh, organization and being super organized, but also telling your time where to go, because there's only so many minutes, so many seconds, so many hours in a day. And then you compound that with, I have to be a dad, I have to be a husband, right? So limiting myself of, hey, this 30 minutes, this 30 minutes, maybe it's this hour and 15, maybe it's 45 minutes. You delegate tasks of things that need to get done. And... um I think that's one of the major parts of it is being super uh, organized, but I compartmentalize my day when from 8.15 to 2 o'clock, 1.30 or so, uh, I'm doing our AD stuff. And then when 2.30 hits, I'm athletics, uh, during football season is football, during track season is track. Um, and I very rarely, 
and this was not always the case, uh, very rarely brought work home. And uh, that's that's been a struggle. It's like, got to do this, got to put this out, got to, kids go to bed, I can get some stuff home, but then I got to be a husband, right, to my wife. So it's been one of those things of over the last probably six months or three months, I've really honed in on leave work at home, like leave work at work and be home when I'm home. Uh, yeah. And it's worked out really well. You know, we, we had the three H's last Thursday night or Friday night. It was hibachi, hot chocolate, and home alone. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I had to post a graphic and I was like, you know what? That graphic can go out after we do hibachi, hot chocolate, and home alone. There you uh, go. There's something to be said about being a dad, especially in today's society when everything's so fast and get stuff done and people want things now. Uh, it's a lot to just slow down. And, and my main job is to be a dad and to be a husband. Yes, sir. And that reminds me of a quote that I heard. I think it was at AFCA a couple years ago. With Was Dabo Sweeney at the one in San Antonio? He was. Yeah, so he was talking about just, and I think this is the right saying, like blooming where your feet are planted, yeah. whether that be, you know, from a from a job standpoint, but also just what you're saying, like when you're at home, you're at home, but also when you're working, you know, stay focused. So that's, you know, another really cool thing to hear, hear you talk about that. Yeah, it's, and it, it, man, it's not easy. I tell you that, but it's not easy because um, you want to get things done. You want to make things now. I want to limit my plate of, hey, what I have at 8.15 in the morning, what I have at 7.50. And if I can compound that, but also I have a wife who needs me to be a husband. And uh, that's why here lately, I just leave my computer and my bag and my truck and I go in and I have the kids' bags, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unload them. It's not my bag, and it's not. Um, I never want my kid. And, and look, this was in a in a show. If you the people that are listening and watching this, Saved by the Bell, when Zach Morris is uh, dealing with his dad, Derek Morris, and he's on the phone, and uh, he's trying to get his dad's attention, trying to get his dad's attention, and Zach calls off his phone and calls his dad, and he goes, Derek Morris, and is Zach talking? And it's is this the only way I can talk to you? I never want my kids to have that of where they always see me on my phone. They always see me on my computer to where then they eventually go, do you love me more than your computer? Do you love me more than your phone? And I never want to get to that point of that's what they see. And that's what they see uh, their dad doing. And it's not spending time with them because look, the days are so long, but the years are so short. And I just talked to our uh, kids about this when they signed on national signing day for, for fall sports minus football. But um, how fast those days uh, seems so long. Like yesterday, my wife's like, didn't yesterday seem like so long? I'm like, yeah, but those years fly by. Like my daughter will be in middle school. And I remember when she was born. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't waste those days. Right. And, and for somebody like me, who's just starting off in my career, it's, it's really interesting to like, as I'm starting off this process, a lot of times it feels like I'm not really making progress, but like what you were saying is, just focus on each day. And like, even if a day feels long, like yeah. the past two and a half years that I've been graduated, like it's, it's gone in an instant. And right. it's, you know, just, I think advice that I would have for like people that are just starting off. And, and I'm sure you can attest to this too, coach is, you know, just stick, stick to the process and like, whether it be, and, and even if you don't feel like you are making progress, you know, right. just right. stick to what you know is the right thing to do. Yeah, compound those days is what people would say. You want to compound those days uh, and make them the best possible. Are, are those days going to be great all the time? No. Are they going to be hard sometimes? Absolutely. Are some days going to go easy peasy? Yes. Um, it's just making the most of them. I mean, we tell our kids to do the same thing in athletics. Like, hey, don't let that rep bother you. Don't let, hey, flush that rep. Same thing with the day. If a day didn't go like you wanted to, you control your mind and, and go into it. And um Inky Johnson said this too about success. And when you're looking at how, how successful uh, you are during the day is, you know, your success isn't predicated on the person that you're going up against or the day you're up against, you know, don't give me the easy stuff. So I feel like I have a, a win-win uh, yeah. stuff. that's going to challenge me. That's going to make me grow. That's going to, um, you know, push me to the limits of like, you know what, I, I can't do this. Well, that's what your mind's saying. You know, I can't do this, but then you can push to a higher level. But um, don't let your success be predicated on the people that you put you in front of you. Like if you're Inky Johnson, this in Mississippi State, when um, like if you're going against a weaker opponent, right? 
it's uh, like if you want to be Ric Flair going against a no name when you watch WCW for those that are over 40 years old and know what WCW is, um, you know, an easy opponent that you're going to win or right. Macho man, Randy Savage goes against, I mean, you're going to feel like that. If you go against somebody easy, it's an easy win, but you want to go against, you know, days and make those days pretty tough and challenge yourself because in the end of the, end of the day, you're, it's how you're growing and in the coaching profession is how you're growing for the kids that you're going to coach. Um, as a dad, it's how I'm growing to, uh, give life lessons to my kids as they grow up. Yes, sir. So as we're wrapping up here, coach, any last words you want to share with the audience? Oh man, it's uh, just blessed to be on here. Um, coaching is a huge part of my life. I like impacting coaches. I like sharing with coaches. Um, I'm going to Glacier, Atlanta, end of February. Uh, I'll go to numerous clinics just to share. I think that's what our profession's about. You know, there's no new offense. There's no new defense. There's no special teams at all cr critiquing stuff. But the major takeaway I've had with uh, education and athletics or anything in the business world is relationships. Uh, and I think anybody that's listening to this can attest to that is uh, the relationships that you have with your employees, if you're a CEO, your athletes, if you're a coach, and then your kids, if you're a dad what are you doing with those? Like, how are you harvesting those relationships? And uh, are you promoting a healthy relationship with them uh, in order for them to lead? Uh, people are like, oh, you got to have uh, attitudes a big thing. I was like, well, what kind of attitude are you projecting out there? A good one, a bad one? Is it a narcissistic one? Like, what is it? Right. But uh, the attitudes that you kind of go after, but, you know, relationships are a big deal. Uh, we talk about that on our podcast a lot. Um, culture is a big thing for me, obviously with our podcast being the culture class, right. <laughs> um, of how kids, uh, you know, teaching kids different ways. There's no new tricks of culture. It's just being intentional and your, your culture matters, your relationships matter, your leadership style matter, uh, the championships that you win. I'm not talking about trophies. I'm not talking about accolades. I'm talking about your daily wins that you get inside your, um, your locker room inside your playing field, whatever that is, whatever a daily win is. I told that to a coach probably about 24 hours ago is uh, you got to find a daily win. He's like, man, we've been two and 28. We've been, I was like, you got to find a daily win. Like you can't, you can't say, Hey, we're going to win them all. If you've gone two and 28, you can't do that in three years. You can't do that. Yeah. You got to find those daily wins, whether it's, Hey, I want to line all my helmets up properly, or we're going to catch the first 10 balls at practice or, uh, we're going to have great dropbacks or I'm going to tackle. I'm not going to miss any tackles for the first four minutes of practice or whatever. I mean, there's daily wins everywhere. And if you're talking about education, maybe you have a C student, maybe he's going to be a B or maybe a C minus, make him a C plus. Um, so whatever your championship is, but it's process of the ships. And we talk about it in our podcast, but it's uh, relationships and leadership and championships and that championships, whatever you want. Yes, sir. And I, I really do believe positivity breeds more positivity. Yeah. And like, like what you were saying, you know, it's if, if you do are in a bad situation, like find those daily wins. Cause you know, maybe cleaning up the locker room leads to another positive thing, which eventually leads to a win. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it really yeah. is true. Yeah. I got a funny story about that, about a clean locker room. If you have time. Um, yeah. I was the head junior high coach here and, uh, a school that was one of our rivals has not, they hadn't lost a junior high football game in eight years. It was crazy. And um, I was hell bent on clean locker room. We're going to have stuff hung up the, the right way. We're going to put our shoes the right way. We're going to, it's going to be spotless. Because I think that's a part of discipline that breeds onto the playing field, just like you said. And uh, we won 10 to nothing. And uh, one of our coaches was like, do you think, that your clean locker room attributed to you winning that game. I said, a hundred percent. He goes, well, the scheme oh, you yeah. ran, y'all didn't do all that right. I was like, you don't have to do all that right. Plus we're dealing with eighth and ninth graders. So they're not going to get everything right all the time, nor will NFL players, but the discipline of running a play or if something breaks down, they can do that. They can take us back to how intentional were we that the locker room was clean, how there was nothing on the floor, how our helmets were in the right spot, our shoes in the right spot that, you know, in the easiest way coaches, if you want to clean locker room, it's the easiest part. You tell the guy in the middle, if there's a guy on the left and guy on the right, 
those three are responsible for that that section. And I know a lot of coaches run people, Justin, like the whole team if the locker room's dirty and you're like doing your right. part. I'm of this. Um, if I go in those three sections of lockers, so you start with one, two, three. Well, two, one and three are responsible for that. If you go to four, three and five are responsible for that. And if you're in that pot of three and there's stuff around and your locker's not, that, you three are running. Mm -hmm. You three are running. So now you're starting accountability. Now you're starting to instill a little bit of discipline. And then there's some accountability of like, well, well, I did my part. Well, you didn't do your part. So now you're holding a teammate accountable. And that, that promotes leadership. Uh, and I can go on and on about the stuff that uh, that I would do in my – I have a whole – like P.J. Flake has a coaching manual. manual. I have a manual uh, of when I branch out and, and take a head job of, of things that I want to implement that promote that. But that's one little piece that if I'm in charge of the locker room, there you go. Like locker 75 isn't going to run because locker two had a piece of trash on it. Right. But that dude's handling his business. This one – needs to be held accountable. Right. So anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for sharing that story and really appreciate you having on the podcast coach. Best of luck in this off season and appreciate hope it. to hope to stay connected. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I forgot to tell you this. Like we were eight and four this past year, made it to the semis. Uh, a big thing I want to shout out is our head football coach just received a kidney. Uh, he has been on the kidney transplant list since 2018, just received one three wow. days ago. Uh, so oh, answered, fantastic. Prayer, answered prayer for that. Um, during the time he was on dialysis, uh, we won three state championships in a row. Wow. Uh, he's been here 10 years. We've played for it eight of those 10 years, and we've won the conference championship nine of those 10 years. Wow. Uh, so to say that uh, he promotes our program, he is the program. Uh, so Herbert Davis, uh, Hall of Fame coach, and I'm blessed to be a part of his staff and uh, just grateful for the friendships that are here and uh, the coaching community. So anything, uh, just those that watch this continue to pray for Herbert Davis as he goes through recovery only three days removed from a kidney transplant. And uh, for the ones that have been praying that I uh, have put on Twitter and all that stuff. Uh, thank you for, for sharing love for him uh, in this time. Yeah. Well, glad he's glad he's doing well coach. Yep. And, and thank you again for sharing and, and for everything Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Thanks, Justin. Thanks.